Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Matt Letter and today we're going to continue the Pillars of Eternity Let's Play series. In the last episode we've arrived in the Deerford village and did some beginning quests out here. And we also kind of pissed right. off Horse Domino, though they do not know of it yet. They will though. So, let's take a careful look around. There's still the house hardwood guards asking around. Uh, no, this is stealing. So we have the arms and armory, the apothecary, apothecary, the curry, and the grieving mother to deal with. We start off with the blacksmith. Maybe they have something interesting in their stocks for us. I mean, by now I can certainly um, afford nearly any upgrade they had. Uh, they have on hold there. So, Winfrith. Welcome. A portly, smiling man stands behind a warped wooden counter, polishing a buckler. He looks up. Haven't seen you before? Always glad to see a new face in town. Company's good for business and chatter's good for the soul, that's what I always say. Anyhow, what can I do for you? Uh, first of all, I'm looking for a young woman named Elise. The Lord's got you asking around too, eh? Hmm. <laughs> At least you ask politely enough, better not having a small army move into town, but then they start throwing their weight around and telling you your business. He shakes his head and clucks. That's the problem with these lords, they think their money and their family name entitle them to some kind of special treatment. They expect everyone to fawn over them in the way their servants do. No sir, that's not the kind of people we are, not in the Deerwood. We break away from Adair to get away from that kind of nonsense, if they think... and so on. Uh, excuse me, but what does any of that do with Elise? We are passionate. Of course, of course, I was just getting to her. <clears throat> I haven't seen her. Not since she went missing anyways. She mostly kept to herself. He shrugs and wipes the buckler again. But you know how women are. Always carrying on, full of palaver once you get any two of them together. Perfectly harmless, mind you. I'm not criticizing. Just feels like they never run out of things to say. The girl seemed rather quiet, downright shy if I do say so. But even Hen Hendina got her talking. Just goes to show. Hendina? An alchemist runs a small stand near the center of town. Talented lady, but she had a run-in with some worms not long ago. She's lucky it wasn't that ogre that's been roaming around. He took all of Rumble's pigs the other day, did you hear? But don't get him started. He still... He's still sore about the subject, and once you get him wound up about the ogre and his pigs, he won't just stop talking. That's good, so... What's else been going on here? Oh, we're a quiet little town, and not much happens here. Spe especially not since Legacy hit. People realize they couldn't have babies and just stopped trying altogether. And that takes a lot of excitement out of the day-to-day, -day, if you can believe it. Oh well, then show me what you have for sale. He actually has a couple yellows there. A two-handed pike. Uh, crits can inflict prone. That's always nice. The hours of Saint Rumbold. Oh, that might be what something for our uh, main character. Crits can also inflict prone. More crit damage. It's accurate, so more accuracy and more damage. That's pretty good. Okay, what else? A Grudge Keeper. A Rod. We could use something like that as well. Piercing Slash damage. More accuracy, more damage. Uh, more damage against prone, stunned or flanked enemies. Not that great, actually. And Ritesi's Thorn is a spare. Hmm. Okay, let's see what else. Uh, mosquito. More accuracy and damage, still more damage. Oh, damage restored as endurance. That's pretty good. Though we have nobody who really uses a rape here. Uh, Angios Gambeson. Athletics, more damage reduction, and deleterious alacrity of motion once per rest. And a whole bunch of these things here. Let's actually get a torch. And I think we use a second pry bar. A voice of the mountain top. Ah, nice. It's for the chanter, more area of effect. Could be useful for Kana. I think I'll take it and store it for now. And other than that, um 
Yeah, I'll keep that one in mind and then check out what our main character has as a weapon. Let's see. Right now, Justice. Uh, does a bit more damage. And more accuracy and damage still. So not that great, actually. I think we may go ahead and get the... Uh, Good day to you. St. Rumble something something. The Hours of St. Rumbled. Let's read its story while we're at it. Oh, well, that's quite a bit. Uh, St. Rumbold was among the first of the Euthasian pilgrims to take up the Emperor's offer of resettlement in the distant territory of Recrus. A dedicated priest of the Shining God, Rumbold was regarded as a leader in his community, known both for his unwavering dedication to his congregation and his stern vigilance against lapses in doctrine. What survives of his sermons reflects this duality, for he emphasizes the redemptive power of the faith even as he warned against the dire punishments awaiting those who rejected Eothas' beneficence. The colonization efforts brought Eothasian settlers into direct conflict with the native Orland populations, and Rumbold was among those credited with routing several brutal attacks upon the settlement. Ultimately, however, Rumbold was mortally wounded during a violent raid. Witnesses claimed that upon the moment of his death, Rumble's body was suffused by an overwhelming burst of light, knocking the remaining Orlan warriors flat or else scattering them back into the forest. Accounts arose of Rumble's final hours, describing a great miracle which were observed to have occurred during the day predicted in his death. Preceding his death, Eothas, it was said, had informed Rumble of his fate, and the priest accepted this gladly and without fear, for he knew that death was only the first step in his rebirth. He subsequently marked each of his final 27 hours with a mir miraculous act, such, such that his congregation would know of the gifts of Eothas had bestowed upon him and continue Rumble's work in his stead. Rather than stanch the flow of Eothas and Satyrs, Rumble's death only encouraged more pilgrims to venture across the sea, eager to set their eyes upon the final resting place of Eothas's favorite servant. The Arrows of St. Rumbold was forged in dedication to this patron saint of the resettlement, and its blade is inscribed with markings counting the 27 hours before Rumbold's passing. In such manner was the blade imbued with the saint's power. It was said that the man's might it was said that a man might kneel before the sword and know which pre precision the mo and know with precision the moment of his death. There we go. So yeah, let's uh, spend over ten thousand. We still have about that much left. Oop, put in the drunk slot. There. Actually, looks pretty cool. Pretty broad blade there. Okay, with that said. <clears throat> let's move out and let's find uh, the lady he was talking about. The alchemist. Maybe she knows uh, where uh, the young lady has gone to. Uh, that would be over here somewhere, probably here. Yep. She's hurting. Hello. A young woman leans against a wagon. One arm on one side of her face are covered in bandages. Oh right, that's why she's hurting. With raw, rippled flesh showing underneath. A minty, tangy sand wafts from her dressing. She smiles painfully. Just ventured into town. I'm about dry on some of my stocks, but you're welcome to have a look-see. Uh, how did you get burned? Since we're honest, she turns her face to the ground. By the flame, how bad does it look? Just say it. I know you'll tell me straight. Relax, it's not that bad. I know a kind nothing when I hear it, but thanks. I've been keeping an eye on Drake's on a Drake's nest east of town at Deerford's Crossing. The beast stayed just long enough to lay a clutch and moved on. Thank the Sky Mother it wasn't a full grown dragon. She looks at her bandaged arm and grimaces. Fresh eggs are much more useful than the ones that get passed between merchants or left in the nests for weeks or more. And that clutch looked to be at its peak. Thought I'd see about getting neck, but I didn't realize so many of them had already hatched, or that young worm were so territorial. Eggs. So what's so special about these eggs? They're one of the strongest tonics known to Kith. If you leave out Carogol if Carogolan, of course, not saying anyone should take that. But dragon eggs are known to make Kith bold, purposeful. Some of you think they'll protect from Bewicks. All I know is everyone's pining after potions made from dragon eggs. But, them damn, but the damn roads. Can't reach none of my suppliers, so I'm stuck with whatever I can scrounge up in the woods. Deer cap, river reed, and the like. Well, I could get an egg for you. 
Ooh, something because we're kind wayfarers. Been a long while since we've gotten one of those, actually. She keeps her gaze steady, but you see hope kindling in her eyes and twitching and twitching at the corners of her mouth. I was hoping you might. I heard the kind wayfarers are good with this sort of thing. She bites her lip. If you really mean to go after it, I'd certainly pay you. Just remember, big as they are, dragnecks are fragile. And there's a lot more than I can do with a whole one. Hail, traveler. Anything else I can do for you? So... Let's take... Yeah, actually, I'm looking for a missing noble one. Oh, that Lord's daughter? She was a new shade of green when I seen her the other morning. Chatting with Tigril, she was just outside his shop. He points at the crumbling tower. Uh, yeah, you're talking about morning sickness. Was she pregnant? She sighs. I and worked into a state about it, she was. That girl was so sick she didn't even notice Tigril's stink. I offered her some herbs to... Take care of the problem, though it might save her some trouble with her old man, but she wouldn't have it. Yeah, Lord Heron said she was ill from travel. <laughs> they were no road sickness, trust me. I know it when I see it. So, yeah. What's wrong with her exactly? Okay, so that's why we had the survival. So, yeah. Thanks for the information. Hail, traveler. Uh, what's wrong with the roads? Noise of disgust rattles from her throat. <sighs> Brigands, looters, you name it. The gods may be hollowing out our babies, but it's grown fog that's rubbing out of the rest of us. People are scrambling to defiance baby because they hear there's healthy births there, and all those refugees are abandoned homes attract desperate swords like flies on dog shit. Okay, so show me what you have. A lot of ingredients. Hey, we'll keep it in mind. Uh, this one is what? Just a random house? Let's go in and see. I'm interested to see what the grieving mother is about. Just let me take a quick drink here. There we go. Okay, a ledger lies open on the desk. It lists purchase and sale amounts of various alchemical ingredients and concoctions. Okay, so maybe her house. So, I think that's it down here. Now we can go to the grieving mother. Yep, and so, then Ala, to Tiggles. Have you ever woken up to find your other half used your body during the night? I don't think I understand you. And I'm not sure I want to. Well, I've found that if I go to sleep hungry enough, I wake up covered in blood and delightfully full. <laughs> Just druid things, huh? There we have her, the grieving mother. <clears throat> the woman looks briefly through you, as if he doesn't know you're there. The middle-aged peasant woman is dressed in brown leather cloth, draped down to her knees. Her hands are working at, separate, at separating stringy, colorless vegetables in a pile before her, stripping the heads of the long, fibrous stems with a piring knife. <clears throat> She discards the stems one by one, placing the heads of the vegetables into a small cradle-like basket in front of her. She doesn't greet you as you approach. You're not sure she even knows you're here. Okay, uh, excuse me? The woman doesn't respond. She keeps stripping the heads from the vegetables with a steady rhythm. She may be deaf. There's no indication she heard you. Let's look closer. At first glance, she seems nothing more than a middle-aged woman, unremarkable, maybe less stern than most, who seems more focused on the weaving in her lap than her surroundings. Yet you suddenly notice she is not stripping the vegetables before, he before her any longer. She's weaving, and the vegetable pots are now missing. Okay. She still pays you no mind, her brown locks torn and snagged from her lack of washing, like many of the townsfolk you've seen. There's a strange blur to her. Even the motions with her hand seems to be playing with threads that lack color, in a shape that lacks interest. It may be that she is half-minded or deaf, but something feels wrong. As you watch her knitting takes an odd cadence, and you have a terrible suspicion that something lurks beneath what your eyes are showing you. Okay. Her brown hair is long, almost impossibly to the length of her hands. 
As you follow the streams of her locks downward, the hair becomes long and black, splitting it off into threads of black and silver and wrapping around her hands. She is forming a soul cradle with the threads, braiding a net in front of you, each finger long and sharp like a series of knitting needles, almost hypnotic. The silver and black strands of her hair weave together, with silver predominating as the highlight, the black shadowing it. Ooh. And suddenly, you are calm. You're on a plateau, almost the height of a tower, several stories high. The plateau is like a table lying beneath a clear sky, and beneath the plateau, surrounding in all directions, a forest, hazy with mist. Although whether it is actual mist, or distance, or recollection. Resting in the curve of a natural arc above you is a great copper bell, all again the size of a man hanging at attention, as if looking down on you and the event unfolding before you. The plateau has soaked in the sun and the rock beneath you is rough and warm. The sky forms a cradle around you. You feel different, not disembodied, but you feel your body, your physical contours have changed along with the surroundings. And you hear a soft series of chimes, like wind chimes. At the sound, the scene gains color and texture, as if, su as if the sound is beckoning you gently forth, feeling your senses and thoughts, like mist rolling softly into a sealed chamber, and... The chime coaxes deeper into the memory. And you're certain it is a memory, a warm one. You're on the stone of the plateau, your knees on the warm texture of the ground, silver, white, shimmering like Atra. The plateau is formed of it, glistening in the sun. You can feel the heat on your skin, your wrists and your hands. Your hands are in motion. Weaving. Not threat, but gathering, tenderly moving along the first movements of Bareth's wheel. Your hands are wet. Your hands are upon the flesh of a newborn child, and you can feel the crowning of a tiny head turning in your grip, its head slick, wet from the womb. The hands you are wearing, inhabiting, have done this many times, and they, pra and they are practiced and confident. You can feel distant pains in your own head as the head emerges, the streams of fluid from the womb helping the newborn slide forth, and the woman's labored breathing, crying out. We focus on the child, the movements of the hands. As your hands move, you hear the sound of chimes, clear, cutting through the haze of memory. You cannot see where they are coming from, but they are close, and they are meant as a comfort of that you are certain. We draw the child forth. And coaxed by your hands, every movement causing the chimes to sound again. Almost eagerly, the child comes forth, and as it does, your hands are in motion, weaving, weaving, moving along the length of a soft, wet robe. No, an umbilical cord from the legs of the naked woman before you. You're holding a small child, still wet from the womb, before you. The child cries out, its cry full of life, full of soul, the ring of chimes echoing in its thoughts, filling it with its welcome. The soul is blurred at the edges, as if you're viewing a soul from within a soul. But it is there, it is alive. The woman before you is weeping, and at her first cry her hands reach out for it. Okay, we surrender the child. You surrender the child to her, something you have done many times before, and as your hands move the chimes echo in movement, and you realize the chimes are hanging from cords on your wrists, and where once they echoed in the memory, they are now echoing in the child's mind as well. The chimes are intended to welcome the child, to be its first gentle greeting to the world, a soothing sound guided by the tender motions of your wrists. You are helping to weave it th its thoughts, its preconceptions, and the experience. The experience. The woman lauds with ragged joy, laughing from a parched throat, her emotions seem soothed, but the physical demands of her labor have left her exhausted. But the child is here, the child is safe, and all atop the plateau is peaceful and calm, distant, flattening out as the memory persists. Okay. We slowly pull back, retreating from the memory. Oh, That was an intense memory. With effort, the scene bleeds of color and your mind becomes your own again. There is no pull, no anchor, yet the sound of the chime remains. As they existed in the memory, they sound here as well. And they are hanging from woven braids on the wrists of the woman before you. Even as your head is spinning from the touch of her mind, the sound of the chimes on her wrists is sharp and clear, as if coaxing you back to the real world. The woman still sits before you, but she is nothing like what you first saw. She is wearing black, shredded garments that drape over her form like streamers. Her hair is streaks of black and run through with silver. Her age is almost impossible to tell. She simply feels old, 
like a crumbled watchtower. As she lifts her head to face you, you can see her hair draped across the front of her face like a veil. What, what you first saw of her was a mental glamour of sorts, unconscious, and you realize what you see now, what you see is not what the world sees, and you are perhaps the first one to see her true self. Still, you don't sense a threat in the realization. If anything, you feel a sense of relief from the figure. You can hear her thoughts, and she is glad to be at last seen. Oh, well, that's interesting. So, who are you? I am seen, but the eyes of others do not remember. You were the first to see me as I am, the call stripped aside. There's a light touch on your mind, a caress, and her left hand mirrors the motion of the touch, reaching up to the air between you. You hear the chime on her wrist sound softly. Her hand moves as if pantomiming the rest of your cheeks at a distance, and she speaks softly and slowly. Your memories. The cadence of wheels on a caravan track. Fever. Questions by running water. Violence in a night's campfire. Arrows in the dark. And fleeing. Falling rock and cracking stone. And a storm. The storm. A storm that brushed you. Did its screaming wake you from your mind's cradle? Your memory of it is painful. Its cry is difficult to ignore. It's like a child. Many children crying out. She is an interesting character. Okay, yeah, I've encountered a beer wig, yes, and it did something to me. Her hand withdraws shyly, the chime sounding softly once again. The woman stands, uncertainly, as if she has been sitting for some time, or is too weak to bear her own weight. You notice her cheekbones are tight, her face gaunt, yet while her stance is weak, she seems determined to stand before you. You are able to see me. It is almost a question. You suddenly realize she doesn't seem to know what you saw when you looked at her. The image on the plateau, yet the image was so clear, so sharp, you're surprised she didn't feel you there. See me as a rare gift, a watcher's gift. Hmm. Okay. Which response is best suited? I've never been able to do that with a living person, except with you. So many questions, thoughts whirling like storm winds. That storm still roars through you, deep beneath your thoughts, yet muted and secret, like an underground river. I cannot tell if it is carving new channels, or eroding what keeps your true strength buried. The fact that you could hear it at all, survive it, is something few have ever done. Your power will grow stronger with each soul you touch, as it allowed you to reach out to mine. There is a silence, and although it seems to last for but a heartbeat, in your thoughts it stretches out between the two of you, like a pull between your minds. You blink, take a breath, and then you realize she wants to ask a question, yet can't form the words, as if assembling them is painful, but there simply are not enough pieces. Huh. Assemble the thought. Do you wish to travel with me? You feel a wave of fear, gusted with the strength of a relief, although oddly, her expression does not change. Then fear dissipates and you feel strength and certainty, as if the plateau from her memory lies beneath you, and the calm sky looks down upon you. Okay, she is a cipher. Makes more sense. <clears throat> so... How do I want to set up my party? I do definitely want to keep my two spellcasters and Sagani. That is sure. Main character needs to stay and... Heravius is not strong enough to stand at the front line as um, a dare would. And we definitely need someone else at the front line to keep the enemies busy. So, for now, let's May get him out watch your step. and take the Grieving Mother. 
Your thoughts must flow deeply indeed. And then... Uh, let's see. So, she is a Metafogue 8th level Cypher. Pretty decent int and dexterity. <clears throat> oh, she is actually a massive stealth buff. That's pretty good. Uh, currently, Thyan Padded Armor will get her something much better. Mental Fortress. Plus defense against frightened, confused, charmed, dominated, and terrified. And that's great as well. So, fighting spirit. <clears throat> oh, once she's below 50%, she gains more accuracy and damage for about half a minute. Soul Whip. Uh, focus below maximum, then melee damage, range damage, focus gain, melee damage up. Holy shit, that's actually pretty good. Okay. So, then she has a bunch of spells and talents. The Draining Whip does what? Uh, focus gain, okay. The Biting Whip. More damage. That's great as well. A greater Focus. More Maximum Focus, also good. Mental Fortress we've seen above. So, let's check out her spells real quick. Eye Strike. Blind and daze a target, and enemies around the target in 2.13 meters radius are blinded as well. <coughs> the mind wave. A bunch of damage and then knock enemies prone for a couple seconds. Okay, so we hit the target and then a length of nearly 5 meters in a 120 degree cone. Not bad. Whispers of Treason. Charm someone for 30.5 seconds. That's pretty good. Mind Blades. Oh, holy damn. Five jump targets. One four target and five jump targets. That's actually pretty decent, really. Yeah. Cool. Phantom Foes. Uh, flank a foe and frighten him a little bit. Pretty cool. Recall Agony. Uh, okay, 30% of all damage reapplied. Hmm, okay, so after he's taken some damage, we essentially deal 30% of the damage again. Fractured Volition, we hobble the target and weaken it. Pretty nice. Puppet Master dominates someone for 21 seconds. That's gonna be evil. Soul Ignition does a shit ton of damage. Then we have the Mind Lance. Oh. It's actually pretty good as well. Pain Block, Damage Reduction, and Endurance Regain. Wow. Cyphers are fucking awesome. Silent Scream then. Uh, raw damage and more raw damage. Main target's also stunned. Holy balls, I like those abilities. So... Okay, so she requires focus to cast these things. Depending on spell level, a variety of amount. So these cost like generally 40, these probably 30, 20 and so on. So she can cast all day long. As long as she generates focus. And to generate focus, she is uh, basically just using her weapon. So what kind of weapon do you have? Yeah, she's really all black here. Not even a special armor of anything. Okay, so we'll make her into a melee character, I think. Because we require something at a front line. What's the best we have for you? I'd like to give her a good medium armor, as to not bother her down too much. Currently DR6. Let's give her the scale armor. And weapon-wise, uh, she's pretty open. Uh, what does training do again? Alright, damage restored as endurance. 
I think we may actually go and give her that one. What else do we have? We could also give her a saber. I actually think this thing is more powerful. And we can give it a secondary damage as well. Let's make it a shocking lash then. Let's actually check if we can do the same for a main character's weapon here. Yep. You gain a freezing lash. Because I want that. Oh, we can enchant those as well. Why did I think not think of that? Uh, probably because I'm sometimes pretty stupid. Anyways, uh, we've mm. got an interesting new character in our group now. And we'll have to see how that turns out the next time. I do thank you all for watching while I snack this uh, little bit of uh, stuff here. So yeah, I thank you all for watching. Hope you've had some fun. If you did, you know, comment, like, subscribe, let me know. And yeah, with that said, thanks again for watching. See you the next time. Bye-bye.